I'm Adam Thompson. This is ECG case number four from the Paramedicine 101 Facebook site. Here's the scenario I gave. It's a 70-year-old male. He's got chest pain. He's got shortness of breath. He was working in his garage when it started. He was having a Budweiser. Um, he presents to you, and he tells you he's got an allergy to aspirin and codeine. Why is that important? Well, he's got chest pain. We don't want to give him something he's allergic to. So we ask him, I mean, it's important to ask, what kind of reaction do you have to aspirin? Because if it's going to be life-saving, and his, he says, well, I was never told that I have an allergy, but, you know, I get a little nauseous when I take aspirin. Yeah, he should still get the aspirin if it's going to be a life or death thing. You know, if he's got an MI and he says, I just get a little, you know, sick to my stomach when I take aspirin, still give him the aspirin. You might have to give him some... Reglan or Zofran or Finnergan afterwards, but it's going to help him out. But if he tells you, I have anaphylaxis if I take aspirin, my throat swells up, and I die, obviously he doesn't know if he's going to die, but that's the person you're not going to give the aspirin to, okay? So you're going to want a little bit more uh, uh, information there. But if all he tells you is he's allergic to it and he, he doesn't know what happens... You might not want to give it either. Obviously, you're not going to give him something that he says he's allergic to if it's not just a common side effect. Uh, okay, so the meds he's on, Coreg, Novolog. Novolog is insulin. Coreg, you know, it's a uh, beta blocker a lot of CHFers are on. Gabapentin, that's sim simply Neurontin uh, for neuropathy. Nitrostat, okay, that's like a home nitroglycerin. Metoprolol, that's another beta blocker for hypertension. Omeprazole is Prilosec for GERD. Lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor, usually for congestive heart failure or hypertension. So he tells you he has CHF. He tell you, tells you he's had a cabbage in the past or you see a zipper scar on his chest. Tells you he's an insulin-dependent diabetic, which we know is high risk for coronary artery disease. And he tells you he's got high blood pressure. And you can kind of guess that he's got angina uh, and GERD as well. Okay, so your differential right now is kind of wide. I mean, he's got stuff that can cause chest pain, but you always got to look at the worst thing, right? You always got to say, oh, this could be an MI. So we do an OPQRST, not too much information. I mean, it, it is a pressure, which doesn't really fit the pulmonary or pleuritic type of chest pain. Kind of fits more cardiac or GERD, or, you know, could be angina. Um, the pain worsens with exertion. Again, that really, that fits cardiac. And it's only a 3 out of a 10, which is kind of good. But again, he's a diabetic, so maybe, and he's elderly, maybe his, his pain threshold's a little bit different. So we're going to do an EKG besides the fact. And on our EKG, I, I don't think I tricked anybody. Uh, well, there was a few that might not have uh, picked up on what this was, but I think most everybody kind of got this in the comments section on, on Facebook. But I wasn't really trying to trick anybody. It was just a, a good discussion here. So looking at the CKG, we're going to dissect it. You've got a ventricular rate that's normal, 78. Uh, PR interval might be a little bit long. We do have P waves, and we see that they're upright in all the limb leads except for AVR, which means it's probably a sinus rhythm. The PR interval is a little bit long, so first degree, 0 0.20 is long, right? Or anything greater than that. Well, 208 milliseconds is 0 0.208 seconds. Okay, that's how that, here, let me write it. 0.208 seconds is equal to that. All right, and, and the QRS duration again, 178 milliseconds, 178 milliseconds is equal to 0.178 seconds, and we know that 0.12 or greater is, is kind of wide for a QRS complex. So what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a sinus rhythm, first degree AV block, that's wide, it's a wide QRS complex, right? Okay, uh, so looking at V1, that's what everybody wants to look right away when we say we've got a wide supraventricular rhythm, it's got to be some sort of aberrancy, right? We'll look at V1, and uh, the last wave of V1 is negative, so this is indicative of a left bundle branch block. If you're not familiar with bundle branch blocks and how to type them, identify them, uh, click the link to my videos. I have a two, it's just a two-part quick tutorial on bundle branch blocks. I explain a lot about them. It's really good education, and of course I'm biased because it's my videos, right? So I'll tell you it's the best education you're going to get. Go check out those videos and uh, learn about bundle branch blocks. 
But you're not done with just looking at V1. You also have to look at lead 1 and V6. And they both have monophasic R waves, which are indicative of the left bundle branch block pattern. So we're going to say this is a left bundle branch block. So we're done, right? Interpretation stops. You go ahead and uh, let this patient sign a refusal. No, absolutely not. You're not done because uh, with the left bundle branch block, you can interpret further. Although you may have been taught that you can't identify a myocardial infarction with left bundle branch block. That's not true. We're going to talk about that in a minute. This, in fact, does not meet what they call Scarbosa's criteria for an MI. Okay, but I want to show you some things here. Uh, first thing, we have left axis deviation, our, our QRS axis is at negative 52. You see R is in the middle? QRS axis is negative 52. And between 0 and negative 90 is considered left axis deviation. And it's, if it's from negative 30 to negative 90, that's actually uh, pathological left axis deviation. So let's look at the list of causes. Pay no attention to the fact that I put left bundle branch block here twice. All right, so here's our causes of left axis deviation. We know we have a left fas anterior fascicular block because our left bundle branch is blocked. So, so, oops, both of those are actually blocked, right? We have a left bundle branch block. We've already confirmed it. So both of our uh, left fascicles are blocked. So yeah, certainly we have that. It's not, but we also have a left bundle branch block. WPW, mm, I don't really see any signs of WPW. We do have a wide QRS complex, but our P honorable is long. It's certainly not short. There's no delta waves. LVH, kind of difficult to identify with left bundle branch block because left bundle branch blocks cause this left ventricular strain pattern just like LVH does. And left bundle branch blocks generally have bigger uh, QRS complexes. So in the same sense of us skipping the left anterior fascicular block, you can kind of skip LVH because you've already identified left bundle branch block. Hyperkalemia, uh, Hyperkalemia, the only true way that we'd be able to identify that on this would be uh, a super wide QRS complex, which is, it is wide, but it's not 200 milliseconds wide, right? Which that's where you're really concerned about hyperkalemia. And our T waves aren't thin, tall, peaked T waves at all. Okay, and we, we don't have any sine waves or anything crazy that would indicate hyperkalemia, so we'll cross that out. Q waves from an MI, well, where would those be? Those would be in the inferior leads if it was causing left and uh, left axis deviation. We do kind of see, we have a QS wave here, essentially. And those are little Q waves right there, aren't they? So maybe we do have old inferior wall MI, uh, but it's not causing the left axis deviation. That's probably from uh, the fascicles of the left bundle branch being blocked. Uh, in pregnancy, you'd obviously not expect that in a 70-year-old man. So. That's what's causing uh, the, the frontal plane axis to be deviated to the left. And we do have late R wave progression as well. And if we look at our list of differentials with the late transition of the precordial axis, you will see that left bundle branch block is in that list of differentials as well. So we can kind of chalk up both of these types of axis deviation to be due to the left bundle branch block that's present. And that's pretty much it with uh, this EKG is it was just a quick left bundle branch block, uh, you know, an old inferior wall MI on there, but I wanted to put it out there and see what kind of crazy stuff people came out, for, came out with. Um, and I certainly want to drive home the point that maybe you can't call a STEMI alert with left bundle branch block, but you can interpret further. And Scarbosa's criteria, this is an image from ems12lead.com. Let me give my plug to Tom, ems12lead.com. Okay, um, Tom Boothelay actually talks about this a lot, is Scarbosa's criteria. And what it is, is it's an explanation of how to identify a myocardial infarction in the presence of left bundle branch block. Because with left bundle branch block, you get something called T-wave discordance. For instance, the last wave of your QRS complex will be oppositely deflected in the direction of the T-wave. So if your last wave of your QRS complex is down, your T wave is positive. That's T wave discordance. This is normal with bundle branch blocks and LVH, or left ventricular strain pattern. And the reason in a left bundle branch block you can't call STEMI alert is because when it's like this and your T wave is positive, 
it will actually drag the ST segment up and you'll get ST elevation that has nothing to do with ischemia. So what Dr. Scarbosa identified was, yeah, sure, you'll get some ST elevation, but if it's excessive like this, greater than five millimeters, that's still indicative of an MI. And if you get any concordant ST elevation, for instance, if the, if the last wave of the QRS complex is up and the ST segment is elevated, well, that's indicative of an MI. And if you get concordant ST depression, that would be indicative of an MI because you really shouldn't have any ST depression with left bundle branch block in, in leads that have a negative terminal wave. So Dr. Scarbosa identified this criteria. Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith from Dr. Smith's ECG blog modified it to make even more sense and be easier. Um, he uses 20%, but I'm gonna teach 25%. If you have ST elevation, that is 25%, let me do, use a different color, 25% or more, so STE is 25% or more of the preceding S wave depth. Show you what I mean. Look at this one. Look at this 12 lead. It's an ugly looking left bundle branch block. Okay, or, or pretend it's a left bundle branch block because this terminal wave is actually positive. Um, if you look at this ST elevation here, sure, T wave discordance is normal, but let's say that's five millimeters of ST elevation right there. Let me do a better job outlining what I'm looking at. Let's say that this is five millimeters of ST elevation right there. And let's say that this S wave is 15 millimeters deep. Is five millimeters 25% or more of 15 millimeters? Yeah. It's a third, right? That's 33%. So that would be indicative of an MI right there. That would be indicative of an MI. And that's how you use Scarbosa's criteria or modified Scarbosa's criteria. Lead one looks like an MI. AVL looks like an MI. Lead three looks like a reciprocal lead. And AVF, same thing. So while the, the example from this week didn't meet any of this criteria, if you look at this, it's all normal. There's no excessive discordant ST elevation or uh, concordant ST elevation at all, except for maybe AVR, but everybody ignores that lead, right? The Rodney Danger field of leads, as Dr. Amal Matu would say. We, the, the example I gave this week, sure, it's just a left bundle, there's no MI, but you can identify uh, an MI and interpret even further. So that's all I really wanted to drive home this week. I hope you enjoyed uh, this week's case, uh, ECG case number four. Check out the other ones. Also, I've got a capnography tutorial up now, and uh, the bundle branch block lessons are certainly worth taking a look at. And uh, of course, I'm gonna tell you it's the best education you'll ever get. Here, here again is that list of differentials for axis deviation, and that's gonna be another video that's gonna be coming out soon is the axis deviation video. For now, you can just go to Tom Boothley's blog and learn all about it. Have a good one. I'll see you next time.